Hello all, this video continues on following the post-Enterprise stories up to the formation of the United Federation of Planets, and this time we'll cover the year 2157, looking at the major events as depicted in the book to brave the storm. A lot more went down in this year as Starfleet seemingly began to get its act together when fighting the Romulans, despite the dire state the previous year had left them in. With Starfleet effectively going at it alone and the Coalition's vulnerability to the Romulan hijacking weapon keeping its allies out of the fight, Starfleet had made the decision to take the NX-01 away from the front lines. This was for several reasons. First off, it protected Earth's most advanced ship from the malware of the Star Empire that was routinely deployed in encounters. So far, Starfleet had managed to avoid losing an NX class to their enemy's attempts to capture one through self-destructs. From June 2156 to December, Commodore Archer and the Enterprise had been pulled from the front lines to fly around making friends. Basically, he was travelling from system to system, rendering aid to needy ships, supplying repairs and medical aid wherever it was requested, while the NX-01 was supplied with extra amounts of food, stores and spare parts specifically for trade. Not only did this keep the Enterprise away from the Romulans, but it was alliance building at its most simple level. Several species even invited Archer to meet with their governments to pitch his case for helping out in the Earth-Romulan War but more often than not, the answer was no. Another reason was intelligence gathering. As Archer was tasked with learning everything about the territories he visited, and keep an ear open for Romulan movements that may have upset the local powers. In an interesting mirror, future ships of the name Enterprise would also fulfil similar diplomatic roles in times of war, in both primary and apocryphal canon. We, of course, have Captain Pike and his orders to stay away from the front lines of the Klingon War in 2256. In this instance, the 1701 was tasked with continuing Starfleet's mandate to explore, even as the rest of the fleet was plunged into turmoil. This was so that in some way, even should the UFP fall, the founding reasons of exploration would be preserved. During the course of the Dominion War in 2373-75, the USS Enterprise, NCC-1701E, was in commission, but from the show, DS9, we never got even a whisper as to what it was supposedly up to. The closest we get was that it was patrolling the neutral zone in first contact, set during the opening years of that war, but they dealt with the Borg incident during that film, not the Dominion. A comic series paints the adventures as far more diplomatic in nature, again during a time when the Federation was caught up in active conflict. One of these missions had Picard approach the Gorn hegemony for aid, while others had the ship continue Starfleet's other mission statement to explore. As well as the reasons mentioned in the case of the original Federation Enterprise, this ship also had the added weight of the name's legacy. By this stage, the Enterprise was regarded as a poster flagship of the Federation, which made risking it in engagements a very dangerous thing, as its presence alone could draw unwanted attention to a skirmish, and if it were lost, the blow to morale would be severe. By January the 28th, 2157, an engineering team led by Stillwell, with both Jeffries of Jeffries Tubes fame and Tobin Dax, eventually overcome the Romulan hijack weapon, by making a more analog interface and reducing the amount of networking between consoles. However, this breakthrough was kept secret from the other Coalition members, as Starfleet reasoned that they needed to mitigate leaks and if the others weren't fighting anyway, why would they need it? By the following month, the countermeasures had been implemented across the fleet, and on February the 16th, the Battle of Gamma Hydra system began. A Starfleet task force led by the NX-01 and seven other Daedalus vessels entered the system based on some gossip and hunch work obtained by their goodwill campaign. The Vissians had a listening post near a black hole in the system that was constructed to watch for the advancing Romulans. While they were not joining the battle against the Star Empire, they were prepared to defend their territory from the expansionist force. Archer had reasoned that the Romulans would still attack the outpost in an effort to cut off the Vissians' eyes in the sector so they could move through it to attack Coalition planets, despite the Vissians' neutrality. His hunch proved correct, but he was too late to save the outpost. 
Instead, he encountered a Romulan fleet that outnumbered his two to one. Things were going badly until the Vissians arrived with their own fleet of ten in response to the Romulans' incursion, and they briefly allied with Starfleet to force back the Warbirds. Starfleet lost five ships in the battle. While the Vissians were not going to ally with the humans, they did tow the fleet to their nearest repair station before sending them back on their way. In August, we have the Battle of Galorndon Core, according to these books. If you watch my Star Trek Online story series, you may have seen an alternate tale as to how this system was ruined by the Romulans. In this version, however, the Enterprise had managed to intercept a single Romulan bird of prey, the IRW Raon, in the system and overwhelm it, taking its weapons and impulse offline. Galorndon Core in this telling is a mostly unclaimed world, but one that has a lot of interest from some human researchers, leading to a team of two to be stationed on the surface. The Star Empire, however, wanted the location for a staging ground, and the dilithium deposits on its surface. After all, M-Class planets with dilithium veins are a rarity and sought after for the relative ease of access to the rare mineral. The Romulans had already landed a team on the surface to sack the humans' facility, presuming it was more nefarious than two biologists, but the Enterprise dispatched its own Mako team and photoned the hell out of the orbiting enemy ship, captained by Chulak. The vessel retreated at warp speeds before circling back at warp 4 and colliding with the planet. The multi-warp collision destroyed much of the Garden World's surface, caused immense tectonic activity, and released high levels of electromagnetic energy that even years later in 2366 would still degrade technology and even the nervous systems of most humanoids. There was also another skirmish in the Prentaris system that only lasted 36 minutes and resulted in a Starfleet victory, although with great losses to their fleet. This combined with the two prior victories at Galondon Core, which resulted in the loss of the planet, and the Gamma Hydra encounter, where over half of Archer's fleet worlds lost, leads to a strong lapse of morale, even in victory. Hoshi even has a bit of an understandable breakdown over it. Meanwhile, the Decepticons, I mean the Romulans, were busy securing their other flank, the Harkonnen Front. After their failed attack on the species on the orders of the mentally declining Praetor de Deridex, the Star Empire had been bearing the brunt of a Harkonnen counter-campaign that was diverting Admiral Valdor's attention and splitting the Romulan war effort, just as the Admiral had feared. This was sorted out when an overly ambitious Romulan commander, de Garth, acquired a modified version of the mutagenic pathogen that had afflicted the Enterprise crew in the episode Extinction. She then dropped it on the Harkonnen homeworld, causing the entire species to rapidly be overcome by its effects, and they set off in search of Urquat, the home of the species that they were being morphed into. So basically, the Romulans wiped out the Harkonnens. It's worth pointing out that this action was not condoned by Admiral Valdor, as he, quite rightly, feared the effects of this mutagen, despite assurances that the Romulans, like Vulcans, were mostly immune. Dagarth was executed for her risky actions. So this pretty much brings us to the end of 2157, the year that saw Earth actually begin to win against the Romulans, but they were hardly turning the tide, as every victory came at a huge cost, and the Star Empire had not even been wholly concentrating on the Earth campaign. On top of this, Vulcan continued to stand by its policy of non-interference, despite its status as a coalition planet, and was increasingly concerned with its own security after the attack on Mount Salaya. So, thank you for watching this part of the Early Federation series, but again not too much word on what Andor or Tellar got up to, aside from the occasional supplies and aid from sympathisers with Earth from within their governments. I'll keep digging around the apocryphal lore to see what else went down, as I have left out a lot of details as I don't want to spoil the books for anyone who intends on picking them up. Thanks again for watching, I've been Rick and I'll see you next time, goodbye.